Hello again, art history students and art appreciators. So today we're going to um, continue our discussion about the modern aesthetic and what's happening in modern art. And we're going to focus on impressionism and um, going to talk a little bit about the invention of photography today. So just as a quick review of main points, we've been talking about art academies and their influence on artworks. Their um, kind of like rigorous standards of where artworks are placed within the salon, where what size and description an artwork can go under, the categories, like just basically the restrictions that this had on the artwork and how modern artists are breaking that, that tradition. Uh, one of those is Gustave Courbet, which we talked about in a previous lecture, uh, specifically just wanted to bring back the stone breakers. So realism uh, broke kind of the mold that was created by art academies. If you remember, this painting is enormous. It's almost eight feet long or eight and a half feet long, and it has no narrative. It has no connection to antiquity. It has no divine story that I can tell you about who these people are or anything like that. The storyline is basically that the stone breakers are this terrible job. This was a modern day occupation for the time. And this was the master stone breaker. And he was eventually going to pass away. And this apprentice would take his place and someone else. And the cycle would essentially continue. That was the narrative. There was this anonymousness. There was no kings or queens or people from uh, Greek stories or anything of that nature. So with that in mind, I just wanted to take a farther reach back in history, just as a quick review. If you remember um, the early Italian Renaissance, this is the birth of Venus from the early Italian Renaissance. And then from the Venetian Renaissance, this is Titian's pastoral concert, right? So if you just kind of like, just to jog your memory just a little bit, um, one is the depiction of um, a goddess from antiquity that during the Renaissance, this was no longer worshipped. It's not like when this painting was created, no one was worshipping Venus. It was this trying to reconnect with the past. And then in Titian's pastoral concert, um, we see this kind of like luxury life of the Venetians, right? There's this beautiful weather, beautiful, everything's beautiful. The women are beautiful. The sky is beautiful. The music is beautiful, even though we can't hear it, right? There's this kind of beauty of life that's being depicted there. It's also two clothed men and two uh, nude women, one is bathing. So all those will kind of be refreshers. All right, so back to this moment in history that we're talking about. So we are talking about a date. I've told you guys before, if I haven't, I'm telling you now, I am not big on dates. Uh, you can Google information like that. What I'm much more interested in is what comes before something, what comes after something, the kind of order of operations so that you understand how one art movement or one art work influenced things that came later. But there are a few times when dates are important and 1863 is one of them. That will be a test question. We're gonna look at two paintings specifically from this exact year. The first one is um, The Birth of Venus by Alexander Cabernet. So this painting was well received by the Academy. It was actually in 1863, it was like the showcase painting for um, that year's salon exhibition. So what are we looking at? We're looking at Venus, right? Just like we saw in that early Italian Renaissance painting, right? She's coming up on the foam, coming up to shore. She's fully nude. She's surrounded by pute, right? If you remember, there was a sculpture uh, from uh, our Roman lecture uh, where the pute were discussed, right? You might be more familiar with them as sort of like these Cupid kind of creatures. They're like congregating around her and celebrating her birth as the, the goddess of love. Now, she's fully nude. She's very idealized in her figure and form. And she has this sort of submissive gauge or submissive gaze. She's not quite making eye, direct eye contact with you as the viewer. Her eyes are slightly shielded, that sort of thing. So that gaze is important. 
So there is all of that information just kind of listed out for you. And then the uh, connection to previous art history up here with that early Italian Renaissance by Botticelli, Birth of Venus. So now we're talking about when realism becomes modern art. Right, so this will, we're gonna come back to the painting we were just talking about in a moment. So realism changed this idea that the academies had to, that the academies had established. The academies had to establish all of these rules about artwork. And those were really kind of being pushed aside by realism and fresh ideas about what art is about is kind of the main goal of this lecture. There's this tendency away from the narrative. There's this experimentation with what we're seeing and how we're seeing and is what we're seeing connected to reality? Does it have to look like reality? Um, those kind of questions are what artists are looking at. So this is Edward Manette's Luncheon on the Grass, right? So there is a French term for this painting here. I'm not going to butcher it. I'm not going to pretend like I can uh, say that with confidence, um, but we're just gonna refer to it as Luncheon on the Grass. It is also from the year 1863. Now, the previous painting that we looked at, which was The Birth of Venus, was the showcase painting in the salon and the exhibitions uh, at that year, 1863. Now, there were a lot of paintings that were rejected, so many paintings that were rejected, there was enough for all the artists who had been rejected to gather their works together and say, okay, let's put on another show, a show called The Salon of the Refused. And it's basically going to be all the paintings that don't get into the show. And we're gonna showcase them together, right? And this was very much so a, like a kind of underground, stick it to the man kind of thing like a you know very much so a thumb in the eye of the academies and this was one of the paintings that was in there the salon of the refuse eventually because it continued over time became more popular than the exhibitions which was ultimately the goal of the artists so let's break down this painting and kind of what we're seeing so we're seeing like just right off the bat we're seeing two women and two men fully clothed men um bathing and nude women now when we compared uh the previous painting the woman in the foreground what had this very submissive view right so the birth of venus the woman had a very submissive view she wasn't quite making eye direct eye contact with you as the viewer this lady is right this lady in the foreground is looking right at you right at your eyes now she's not a goddess she's not idealized in her form or figure right and she's also a modern woman and how we know that is by her modern clothes and her straw hat that are here on the ground next to her so she's not a figure from some greek myth or something like that she's a regular lady who is existing today. Same way with these gentlemen, they have uh, regular attire on for the time period, right? Now, artists are also experimenting at this time with what you're seeing, right? So we have this illusion of a narrative, right? With this, there's all these characters in here, but there doesn't seem to be, we're not able to put together a narrative. This person isn't familiar. There's no iconography identifying this man as this character from history or this man they're kind of these anonymous people and then in the the idea of what we're seeing is let's look at this lady in the background look how big she is right think about the distance between the characters in the foreground and then the river that exists in the background look at that boat presumably all four of these people arrived on that boat if that lady were to step out of the water and walk forward towards the rest of the characters, she would be huge. She'd be twice their size, right? So is this a mistake? Is Edward Manette just like, oh, I made a mistake? No, these are very intentional things that he is putting forward, right? Very intentional reasons. He's experimenting with how we see, why we see, what's important. For so long, artists have been told by the Academy, 
this is what's important. This is what you must do. This is how you must do it, right? So now artists are finally, because of realism, which is not over at this point in time, but has broken that mold, right? And artists are not having to tell uh, or having to follow those strict rules, artists are really starting to break and experiment with that. So here's the big information about luncheon on the grass. 1863, remember that date, shown at the Salon of the Refused, right? And then this painting technically from a later art history perspective marks the beginning of modern art. But I want you to understand it's not like at the time that it was shown in the Re Salon of the Refused, it's not like people were standing there going, okay, we're in the modern art movement now, right? That's something that later art historians reflecting back have denoted this as the beginning of modern art, this painting specifically. Okay, so here are those two side by side, both of them 1863. There might be a test question about comparing and contrasting them. There might be, so I'm just kind of throwing out possibilities. What do they have in common? What are they different? That kind of stuff. You review that info. All right, moving on. I really like to show uh, this painting, which is from 2004, 2006, it's a uh, history of art timeline. So I wanna just point out a couple things. You can note that uh, starting out here, right, which is, we talked about art history going farther back than this. We've talked about art history from other places, but note how all of these have little arrows, like they're pointing forward, right? The Gothic moment moved into the Northern Renaissance. The Northern Renaissance moved into Baroque. Baroque moved into Rococo and Neoclassicism. Neoclassicism moved into Romanticism, which is this kind of orange square here. I'm gonna circle it a couple times and that's difficult to see. And that's the last one that's an arrow, right? And then also, if we look at the dates up here, we kind of go chronologically on this orange line. And then right here between 1800 and 1900, about the halfway mark, the color changes, right? So there's all the art before 1863, and then after 1863, something is happening, right? There is this explosion that is happening. So we are talking about that moment in time, right when everything is starting to change and things are gonna get hectic, I guess I'll say, as we move into the future. So just a little bit of a precursor, just a little bit of, I wanna try to emphasize how important this moment is in art history and I think this painting which is I mean not super contemporary 2004 2006 uh, but still from our time frame you know clearly emphasizes that moment is a, a change in history okay so what else is happening around this time that could influence and be part of the context of why so much is changing in art history so it's got a lot to do with societal changes. There are major inventions, industrial revolution inventions happening, railways, steamships, um, urban development, uh, thing commodities are being mass manufactured, stuff like that. There's this expanding middle class, which means that there's no longer this clear hierarchy, especially remember when we talked about the Rococo period, there was this clarity of, people with money and wealth, right? The aristocracy, and then everybody else was super poor down here. That is starting to kind of equalize out as there is this, don't get me wrong, there's still super rich people and still super poor people, but there's this majority of people becoming part of the middle class. World War I breaks out, which is also going to lead to advancements in technology. Also, anytime there's war it's one of those dips in prosperity which we've kind of talked about a couple times in this class that kind of rise and that prosperity and art and how those things are um, aligned often and declines in prosperity kind of get perspective for what is to come next and then there's something else which is the invention of photography and the invention of photography changes what artists what art can be for and about. So let's explore that a little bit. So uh, the word photography derives from the Greek drawing with light, 
there's this kind of like film, which is the traditional way. And then today we're using pixels and stuff. So the big thing I want to drive home is how the mechanics of the camera are not that different than the mechanics of the human eye. Let's look at a slide about that. So there used to be this thing, as they still exist today, called the camera obscure. It was this way that artists could get this reflection of the world outside. Now it was upside down, right? But it basically was putting a canvas in a dark room with a, a lens, like a curved lens, right? That had to be that oval shape. And things on the outside would reflect in. There would be this reflection that was created on the canvas. Now, this is actually pretty much how your eyeball works. This is not a biology class. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but your eye reflects light in and then it's upside down. And then our brains flip it back around, right? So technically what we see is we see everything upside down, but our brain, our brains are built for that. So it flips everything back around for us. So the camera works very similarly. All right. So let's talk about how some artists use this. So the camera is invented, and at first it's definitely a rich man's toy, right? For, for or, or a, I don't want to say, but you know, like it's a kind of a, it's a toy for the aristocracy. It's not in the hands of individuals. It's not any kind of art thing. It's just this new technology that is fun and exciting and changing everything. But artists know that it is changing what they kind of can be for and about. So this, this gentleman, Oscar Gustave, uh, creates this artwork called The Two Ways of Life. So he is looking at Renaissance paintings and influenced by Renaissance artwork when he creates this. But how he creates it is by taking negatives. So he took a whole bunch of pictures of people and places. And then essentially, this is like the earliest form of Photoshop. He cut them all out and then arranged them together and then took another picture from all of those negatives. So it, you'd have to look closely, but these figures were never in the same place at the same time together, even though it's a photograph. It's not a real image. It was these, you know, we'll just take these two characters in the foreground. They were never standing in the same room at the same time in those same positions, right? It's because the artist did this very, like I said, early version of Photoshop. To us today, considering how much technology has evolved, we're like, okay, we get it. But for the time, this was revolutionary because there was this idea that like photographs were real and this was kind of like something that was not real. And what the artist's intention was, was to say that photography can be an art form. That was what his goal was. So there's this separate, okay, he made 30 separate negatives there. I knew that number was there and then arranged them as puzzle pieces. So it's this, composition he's using his artistic composition skills but with this new technology so it was kind of a it was revolutionary for the time all right another artist who was really thinking about what uh photography could be about was um thomas atkins so he was also a uh, teacher in the americas uh here during this time and really thought about what photography could capture and what it could be like as art had never been able to capture action right it had always tried to remember how we talked about the narrative of artwork and we talked about things like the linear method of describing an artwork and how you read it like a story a lot of this class has been story time with Lacey so he's really interested in motion and action even though there's no narrative to this he's interested in that depiction of motion Remember, the f like photography was just invented. Video and film and computer and all this kind of stuff. If you can imagine life without those things, try to empathize with the people of the time. They had never seen anything like this YouTube PowerPoint video that you're looking at right now. 
All right. So I just want to take a side step and talk about how photography really changed a lot of things outside of the art world. And um, but through the art world, it was like this technology merging with art was able to change a lot. So if you're not familiar, this is Lewis Wiki Hines. So Lewis Wiki Hines was a person who was an artist, wanted to be a photographer, but ended up being kind of like an investigative journalist. It was not super intentional on his part to do all that he did. So let's break down and tell you what he did. So he was interested in documenting and showing child labor specifically in cotton mills. Um, so this was something that was taboo, but not like illegal. You know what I mean? It was kind of like a gray area in society. So anytime you couldn't go in and take pictures of the, you know, child labor happening. So what uh, Hein did was he created essentially like like a camera in a suitcase, kind of like a James Bond spy thing. And he posed as a purchaser of the mill and would go into these factories and other places and take these photographs of these child workers. Then he took all of those and put them on display in gallery settings. So who goes to galleries, right? Who goes and looks at contemporary artwork? It's usually people with wealth and education level, right? It's not the parents of these children. It's people who maybe possibly have influence to do something about it. And him taking this unseen part of society and really thrusting it right into the face of wealthy individuals actually changed uh, laws were actually changed because of this. It really brought the idea of child labor to the forefront, to people's mind. I'm not saying that he solely did that. There were other contextual things happening in society that brought that information forward, but it really put a human face. It really put a child's face looking at you, right, as the viewer, that kind of thing. It really exposed to this kind of underground child labor taboo and made it illegal from that point. So that's kind of a little side thing about art or about photography. All right, so let's back to painting and photography as kind of these two things. So I have two artworks set up here that we're gonna compare and contrast for a moment. So the first one is a photograph of Abraham Lincoln and his son, Thomas, which was who was called Tad. That's this one on this side. And on this side, we have interior with portraits, a painting of two children getting their portrait taken. So on this side of the canvas, you can see there's this gentleman. He's kind of bent over. He has this fabric thing over his head, old cameras. You had to, it was like a lot to going on with old cameras. You had to stay really, really still. That's one of the reasons why um, uh, sorry, Abraham Lincoln, in all of the photographs of him, he's always like really still and stoic. That's because you had to pause. You couldn't move. You couldn't just take a picture. You had to sit there. So these are both from the same year, from 1865, right? Bam, bam. So what's the difference between these, right? So there's a lot of differences and there's a lot of similarities. Let's talk about this paint or the photograph first of Abraham Lincoln and his son. So this is a moment that happened in time that is captured. This was a real moment. At one point in time in 1865, Abraham Lincoln sat at that table and his son stood across the table from him. Sad story, not long after this, Abraham Lincoln's son had passed away of um, like a child fever. Uh, and this was devastating for Abraham Lincoln and his wife. Um, it was not a positive time. He was in the White House. He was the president at the time when his son passed away. His wife kind of 
did not deal with the situation very well. I don't want to like go too much into the story. It was a very difficult thing for her and for Abraham Lincoln. Um, there's a lot of information about, or a lot of possibilities out there. I'll say it like that, that, um, Abraham Lincoln became much more involved in the war effort. He basically drowned himself in, you know, kind of, kind of drowned himself in work to not deal with the death of his son. Right. But this moment did happen at one point in time. These two people were alive at the same time living and breathing and had their photograph taken. Now, in contrast, we have this painting, right, which is supposedly capturing the same moment, right, or a similar moment. We have this brother and sister, right, standing in front of this backdrop, getting their portrait taken, right? We can see by the interior space, right, with this skylight, with all these paintings here, we get the impression that these two children do not live a life of poverty. It's unlikely they're mill working children, right? But they're coming from a little bit of wealth. And it was, you know, regular poor people weren't the ones initially who were getting their portraits taken. Just like in painting, it's kings and queens and people with means and people who are important, that sort of thing. So that's what we see in this picture. Similarly to the story of Abraham Lincoln and his son is that these children pass away, right? By a childhood fever, I think. Don't quote me on that. But these two children pass away and um, this moment never happened. That's the thing. This interior with portraits is not a real moment. It's captured in the painting as if it is a real moment. But this picture of these two children with this backdrop does not exist. The whole thing is a made up, it's not necessarily a fantasy as much as it is like a regret, right? So they're from the same year. So this artist is saying with this painting that is the interior portraits, that what can painting do? Painting can be not reality. If the picture of Abraham Lincoln and his son is reality it did happen it was a moment in that moment was captured and frozen this is a moment that didn't happen right even though it looks and feels like it is a documentation of a moment that happened it's not right so there's kind of one of the ways that photography is changing or influencing how people are thinking about painting how artists at the time are thinking about painting and art as a larger context, but we're kind of focusing on painting at this moment. So I want you guys to keep this comparison in your minds as we move forward. Now we're gonna talk about Impressionism. So Impressionism is a rejection of the academic tradition. Everything that we're talking about right now is usually pretty much like a rejection of the salons and the academies and all kinds of that stuff. So Impressionists choose to paint everyday life. Uh, they often paint outdoors. They're very quick paintings. Um, the Impressionists are, one of the things they're rebelling against is this academic tradition that a painting must take months and be this like super photograph-like depiction, right? Because we have photographs now. You have to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. There are also uh, these kind of quick brush strokes are one of the things that are iconic of Impressionism and their depictions of light specifically. So let's look at that a little bit more. So this is the first Impressionist painting. It's where the um, term comes from. This is Claude Monet's Impression Sunrise. So this artwork was so hated by critics. Um, that one critic of the time, and I do not remember his name, um, said that it was like as if you had taken a cat and dipped a cat in paint and then like swung it around by its tail and hit the canvas. That was how ugly this painting was. And it's called Impression Sunrise, and it's where the term Impressionist comes from. So the artists who loved this painting and wanted to paint in this style and wanted to emulate this painting and Claude Monet himself said, okay, that's that's who we are. It's one of those moments in history where 
you know, a group will kind of take what was said negatively against them and turn it on themselves and wear it kind of as a badge of honor. So this is Impression Sunrise. What are we looking at? We're looking at quick brush strokes, right? We're looking at early, early morning, dawn, the reflection of the water, right? Or the reflection of the sun on the water and kind of the mist that comes in this harbor area as there are a few boats maybe going out, probably, probably going out and not coming in in this early, early morning. So let's look at kind of other examples to clarify what the Impressionists are interested in. Okay. Ah, so this one was shown in 1874 and it had that negative response because of its unfinished quality. So this is Monet's other work or some of his other work, which is the Haystack series. So I have them all here on this one image together rather than showing you 10 slides. Um, so what are we looking at with all of these haystacks? This artist is painting the same subject matter over and over again at different times of day and at different times of year. Why? Right? Because it looks different. Things look different in the early morning hours as they do to the late evening hours because the sun is coming from different directions, right? At noon, the sun is coming straight down. At different times of year, there are different qualities to the light, and that light changes what you see. So sometimes the sky is very clear, and there's these vibrant greens in the background that we see here. Sometimes it's very muted and soft, as we see here. Sometimes there's kind of like contrast, between the foreground and the background as we see in this one, right? So it's the same thing over and over again, showing the major variety of it. Now, these paintings are quick, very high brush strokes, right? That's iconic for the Impressionists. Another thing is, so why is this artist so focused on color and how light is changing color, right? That's one of the big things that the Impressionists were interested in. Think back to photography. Photography is taking these real images, right? Not, there's no longer this need for artists to paint. Let me go to the next slide. There's no longer this need for artists to paint and capture reality exactly as it is, right? Photography can do that. Photography is also black and white, right? So artists are interested in quickly capturing kind of these moments, these fleeting moments, right? that can happen. So look at the reflection on this water, right? And we have these people at this um, kind of like boat party, I guess is uh, what this is, right? So there are people boarding the boat and coming off of this um, ferry boat, right? They're upper middle class people. This is an everyday moment captured very quickly. It's not about capturing the precision of all of these leaves on these trees in the background. It's just quickly capturing where the light is hitting the trees, here and here and here, where the shade is, right, at the bottom parts of the trees, right, where the sky is coming through, the reflections of the light on the water, and these people kind of going about their day, right? That's all that this is about. It's not about, there's also this, there's no narrative to it, right, which is very much a rejection of the academy. All of these things are kind of what artists are experimenting with. Let's keep going with more examples. This is Claude Bonnet's Water Lilies, which are a little bit later in his career. Again, reflections in the water, the lilies, the light, right? This kind of reflective quality. Um, what are we looking at? Are we looking at the up? Are we looking at the down? The color mixing, the brush strokes. These paintings are actually very large, and the idea is that you're kind of like visually consumed in the space, right? Like in all of this water and the lilies on top of the water, right? We don't even have the context of where's the shore? How far is the shore away, right? Where are we? Are we on a boat? Are we this, that, the other, right? The artist isn't even interested in depicting that stuff. He's just interested in depicting what he's most interested in, which is how the light and the color is reflecting on the water, right? Okay, this is Renoir's work, right? So this is another one of those depictions of kind of like everyday outdoor life, 
right? So we see that there's these trees up above, right? You can kind of see that here. And then let's look at this gentleman's coat here. It has all these spots of light on it and spots of shadow. If you've ever been sitting under some trees in the at a picnic or something like that, you know that the light filters in. And sometimes there are bright highlights and sometimes there are in shadow. And that's what this artist is interested in depicting, how that light is kind of moving and changing and highlighting things. He's also depicting people having a good time in kind of an everyday moment, right? They're contemporary people. They're semi-anonymous. We can, we can make inferences about their social standing, about their wealth, about that kind of stuff, just because of the clothes they're wearing and where they're at and whatnot, but they're not people from stories way back when or anything like that, right? They're everyday uh, individuals. So interested in light and color, interested in everyday scenes. Let's look at more examples. The spontaneous brushwork. This is another one. This is Caballet's work, right? Paris Street, rainy day, right? We have this use of linear perspective. Look at this water reflections on these cobblestone streets. Oh, so beautiful, right? Everyday people out doing their everyday thing very much so a rejection of the academy right he's still using things like linear perspective right we can see how those that building is going back into space right we can still see all of the the key principles and elements of art that the artist is using successfully but it's what they're depicting that's kind of not so much an interest and also the kind of slight what the academy would call unfinished quality right so there's still these like brush strokes Right, we can see the brush strokes. There's evidence of them. That's a little taboo for the time. All right. Mary Cassatt's work. This is the child's bath. We're going to look at this a little bit more in depth in another uh, PowerPoint, or there is another PowerPoint. I hope you want to look at, say it. Whatever you want me to say that that uh, talks about this in much more in depth. Look at all these patterns, right? So there's pattern here and here and here, and yet we have an unfinished quality to all of them, even the stripes in her um, dress. We have those that kind of brush stroke quality, right? It's not about this accurately, perfectly depicting this carpet, right? That's not what it's about. It's about capturing this moment, capturing the light, capturing the shadow, that kind of thing. Okay, Degas, more examples. Edgar Degas was really famous for painting and drawing and capturing the ballet. That was his favorite subject matter. Um, these kind of ballerinas, think about it, there's lots of light, right? And it's very like specific theatrical light usually in productions like that. You have idealized female forms kind of at their peak. And then also there's often color that's accentuated and exaggerated, right? Blue tutus and pink tutus are usually not colors that you see outdoors in nature, right? So it has all the elements that artists are interested in at the time. Um, and that's one of the reasons why he was drawn to this area or to, to keep depicting these ballerinas. Yep. So Degas was also a sculptor. He would sculpt wax figures of ballerinas so that he could uh, spend a little bit more time drawing them in detail. These were not something that he created as his work. They were like a tool that he was creating for his work. So when he passed away, there were all these wax sculptures that he had created. He had never shown them in any sort of exhibition. He'd never done anything with them. He made them specifically kind of like, kind of in the same way that Leonardo da Vinci would was interested in dissecting bodies so that he could learn more about them. He was sculpting them so that he could think about the thicknesses and kind of like get that muscle memory to his hands. And after he passed away, then they were all cast in bronze. So that's kind of an interesting thing. And then they were there. This sculpture is one of his most famous artworks. And 
it was never something that he expected anyone to see, nor did he ever try to get it cast in bronze. So lost wax bronze casting method, something that we talked about earlier in the semester. All right, moving on. So next we're gonna talk about, this is an artist, um, Surratt's work, George Surratt, took this idea of how color is affected by light to kind of the next level and really thought about how color is affected by the colors that are next to it. So we're looking at this painting of the circus, but let's look at a detail of it. If you look at it more detailed, it is not any brush strokes other than just tiny little dots of color. And those dots of color, when placed next to other dots of color, change. So let's take this lady's leg, for example, right? Or this dress area. So we have the shadow here, kind of have a line that we can draw here, right? So there is the same orangey yellow color above that line and below that line on her leg. But because he's putting white next to it below or lighter yellow, and then sort of darker yellows or kind of like slightly browns, we get the impression that there are two separate colors. And this has to do with something called optical mixing. Optical mixing is essentially how pixels work, right? Pixels, any image that you see online digitally is created with pixels, and there are so many of them, and they're so small and close together that our eyes visually blur them. This is like cut off at the bottom of the screen, but this is actually just red dots and blue dots together, but we see it as a purple area. So that is optical mixing, right? That is what this artist is most interested in. And this comes from what is known or comes to be what is known as pointillism. And it's the use of small dots paired together to make a larger artwork. And this relates back to what Manette was doing with his, or what Monet was doing with the haystacks, right? All of those haystacks interested in times of day and different lightings and all of those kind of interesting features. This artist is interested in the same thing. Okay, key terms and ideas. So the impressionism comes after realism. It's following the breaking of the academic traditions that the salon and the academies established. It is about modern life of the time. It's not about some story. I have no stories to tell you about Greek and Roman mythology and who the characters are and iconography, because that's not what Impressionism was about. It explores how we see and what we see, and the invention of the camera influenced Impressionism. There are a few uh, key terms. Remember the date, 1863. It will 100% be on the test. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me and I will talk to you guys in the future.